So I'm going to run through the uh, IPCC AR6 report, Chapter 7, on health, well-being and the changing structure of communities, which obviously includes migrations, forced displacements and so on, which we have touched upon in the adaptation overall and food security as well. Here we are, I wanted to include this basically because this makes certain points about adaptation for health. This uh, chapter 7 is under the working group 3 report on impacts, vulnerability and adaptation. So I wanted to just have few things included here. Executive summary will read off the main points and then we'll come back to some figures throughout the chapter. It's a very long report as IPCC reports tend to be. So I'm going to make it very brief maybe with uh, two or three podcasts, okay? So let's just read off the executive summaries under well-being, uh, uh, health, well-being, and changing structure of communities. Climate-related illnesses, premature deaths, malnutrition, and all its forms and threats to mental health and well-being are increasing, with we can say with very high confidence. Climate hazards are growing, uh, are a growing driver of involuntary migration and displacement and are a contributing factor to violent conflict. And we have discussed before about how violent conflicts tend to affect women and children much more than men. And often peace times tend to be a better indicator of women's treatment than wealth or democracy. So this is something we must remember. Since AR5, which was released in 2014, new evidence and awareness of current impacts and projected risks of climate change on health, well-being, migration and conflict have emerged, including greater evidence of the detrimental impacts of climate change on mental health. This has become a big factor now. And so I keep harping upon uh, alarmist messages from climate scientists about climate change and how this may add to climate anxiety and mental health issues, which the biggest consequence that we don't want could be the idea that people feel like there is not much they can do uh, since things are so bad and this we want to avoid. So we must have some semblance of balance plus some optimistic vision for the future. Even if you say things are bad, can you say what can be done for the future to get out of this badness, crisis, climate crisis, which is not a word I like at all, okay? With proactive, uh, timely and effective adaptation, many risks for human health and well-being could be reduced and some potentially avoided. Climate resilient development has a strong potential to generate substantial co-benefits for health and well-being and to reduce risks of involuntary displacement and conflict. I'm not reading the confidence levels in each one of them, but you can just read them off yourself. It's a very nice report, freely available. It's very long, so often I find that uh, IPCC requires interpreters to translate that big report into messages. They do provide a, a summary for policy makers, but even those tend to be quite long. Okay. Key transformations are needed to facilitate climate resilient development pathways, CRDPs for health, well-being, migration and conflict avoidance. The transformational changes will be more effective if they are responsive to regional, local and indigenous knowledge and consider the many dimensions of vulnerability including those that are gender and age specific. We have talked about transformational adaptation before incremental versus transformational. It's not always clear how you would bring that about uh, because it may include things like moving entire populations away from the coast or changing livelihoods of entire communities and so on. And it's easy to say we need transformational adaptation, but it's very difficult to see how we bring about uh, in reality these transformational changes. L moving to observed impacts, climate hazards are increasingly contributing to a growing number of adverse health outcomes including communicable and non-communicable diseases uh, in multiple geographical areas. The net impacts of are largely negative at all scales which means climate change is mostly making things worse and there are very few examples of beneficial outcomes from climate change at any scale. This is something to remember. Several chronic non-communicable respiratory diseases are climate sensitive based on their exposure pathways. 
For example, heat, cold, dust, small particulates like PM2.5, ozone, fire, smoke, and allergens, spring arriving early, increasing allergy seasons, and so on. Although climate change is not the dominant driver in all cases, so they are climate change going through pathways to affect these health outcomes. So it's not the proximal cause, but often the ultimate cause of uh, increasing the uh, mor morbidities of these diseases. Climate variability and change contribute to food insecurity, which can lead to malnutrition, including undernutrition, overweight and obesity, and to disease susceptibility in low and middle income countries. Again, not direct, but indirect impact of climate change on food security and health. Heat is a growing health risk due to burgeoning urbanization and increase in high temperature extremes and demographic, demographic changes in countries with aging populations. Extreme climate events act as both direct drivers in, in such as destruction of homes by tropical cyclones, although attribution of cyclone uh, strength to climate change is tricky because there are lots of details whether numbers change or just the intensities change, um, pathways change, people are exposed more because now population is increasing and moving in the path of cyclones and so on and so forth. So anyway, extreme climate events act as both direct drivers and as uh, indirect drivers such as rural income losses during prolonged droughts, some of which is r quite attributable to uh, climate change with high confidence. And there are of course involuntary migrations and displacements which again are conflated with natural variability and other uh, socio-economic and geopolitical factors. Okay. So again, climate may not be the proximal cause, but will tend to be the ultimate cause in many cases. Climate hazards have affected armed conflict within countries, but the influence of climate is small compared to socio-economic, political and cultural factors, which is what I just said. A significant increase in, all, in ill health and premature deaths from climate sensitive diseases and conditions is projected to climate uh, projected due to climate change with high confidence. Climate change is projected to significantly increase population exposure to heat waves and heat related morbidity and mortality. So here duration, intensity and frequency of heat waves are changing but situation is also always complicated. For example analysis over Indian subcontinent shows that heat waves are not only changing in character in terms of duration, intensity and frequency, but they're also shifting geographically. So it's not just that they are becoming more intense and larger area or more frequent in the same s location, but they are shifting. The burdens of several climate sensitive foodborne, waterborne and vectorborne diseases are projected to increase under in climate change assuming no additional adaptation. So the projections into the future about disease outcomes is always tricky because there are uncertainties in the climate projections. They are translated into uh, vector populations, vegetation changes, population shifts and changes, technology changes and then you are computing uh, adaptation as well as disease outcomes. So one has to be careful about this. Nonetheless, it's a risk, so you have to plan accordingly. Increasing atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide and climate change are projected to increase. Um, long stress there. Increasing atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide and climate change are projected to increase diet-related risk factors and related non-communicable diseases globally and increase undernutrition, stunting and related childhood mortality particularly in Africa and Asia with outcomes depending on the extent of mitigation and adaptation. Co-benefits of mitigation on health and adaptation uh, for health obviously uh, are going to determine the outcomes or at least modulate the outcomes. Climate change is expected to have adverse impacts on well-being and to further threaten mental health. Well-being requires some definition which is implicit in here but there are many attribution studies already made for impact of climate change on mental health. Overall climate anxiety is there especially among the youth when they hear scarier and scarier message of what climate change is doing and what it is going to do. 
often without knowing what the uncertainties in those are. So you want to have them be engaged in climate action and climate awareness overall and not just scare the diseases out of them, okay? Future climate-related migration is expected to vary by region and over time according to future climatic drivers, patterns of population growth, adaptive capacity of exposed populations, and international development and migration policies. Climate change may increase susceptibility to violent conflict primarily intrastate conflicts and by strengthening climate sensitive drivers of conflict. This is always tricky. Looking at some solutions, since AR5, the value of cross-sectoral collaborations to advance sustainable development has been more widely recognized, but despite acknowledgement of the importance of health adaptation as a key component, action has been slow. Thing to remember from examples of COVID, for example, impacts of COVID on economy, recovery, and general impact on climate action, that climate action tends to take a backseat at the smallest of excuses, so action is always going to be slow. How to keep climate action sustained no matter what else is happening is not easy. Targeted investments in health and other systems, including multi-sectoral integrated approaches to protect against key health risks health risks can effectively increase resilience. So increased investment in strengthening general health systems along with targeted investments to enhance protection against specific climate sensitive exposures such as hazard early warnings and response systems and integrated vector borne disease vector control programs will increase resilience if implemented to at least keep pace with climate change. Okay, so we are already into adaptation here in terms of solutions. Future effects of climate change on vector-borne diseases can, sig can be significantly offset through enhanced commitment to and implementation of integrated vector control management approaches, disease surveillance, early warning systems, and vaccine development. Adaptation options of future climate risks associated with waterborne and foodborne diseases include improving access to portable water, reducing exposure of water and sanitation systems to flooding and extreme weather events, and improved including expanded early warning systems. I'm a big fan of early warning systems and seriously investing in early warning systems is one of the best adaptation measures we can do instead of worrying about 2040, 2050, 2100 and so on. Adaptation options for future extreme heat risks include heat action plans that incorporate early warning and response systems for urban and non-urban settings, tried, tested and iteratively updated response strategies targeting both the general population and vulnerable groups such as older adults or outside workers and effective stakeholder communication plans. These short-term responses can be complemented by longer-term urban planning and design, including nature-based solutions that mitigate urban health island effects, etc. Nature-based solutions for urban areas include things like permeable pavers, rain gardens, water harvesting, vertical farms, rooftop uh, coloring for uh, reducing energy use and so on okay a um, few more points adaptation options to reduce future risks of malnutrition include access to healthy affordable diverse diets from sustainable food systems health services including maternal child and reproductive health nutrition services, nutrition and shock sensitive social protection, which we discussed before, water sanitation and early warning systems, and risk reduction schemes such as insurance. The COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated the value of coordinated and multi-sectoral planning, social protection systems, safety nets, and other capacities in societies to cope with a range of shocks and stresses. Okay. Uh, this is getting longer, but this is the last one and I'll stop. Transitioning towards equ equitable, low-carbon societies has multiple benefits for health and well-being. Uh, reducing future risks of involuntary migration and displacement due to climate change is possible through cooperative international efforts to enhance institutional adaptive capacity and sustainable development. 
Adaptation and Sustainable Development builds pe build peace in conflict-prone regions by addressing the drivers of grievances that lead to conflict and vulnerability to climate change. So we already talked about how peace is more important as an indicator of how women are treated than uh, wealth or democracy. So working on uh, adaptation and sustainable development to build peace in conflict-prone regions is very critical. Okay, so I kind of read them really fast, but the report is available and my uh, reading is uh, comprehensible. I hope so we'll come back and go through a few more uh, figures from this chapter to uh, add some more points okay this is again uh, adaptation for the health sector uh, present and future okay <laughs>